So um, our next session is on the manage of the cow herd. Um, on manage, management decisions to improve the reproductive performance of your herd uh, from calving to rebreeding. Dr. George Bay will be presenting with Dr. Sarah Murray, but Sarah unfortunately could not join us. Um, so we're gonna be hearing from George. Um, and Dr. George Perry is a professor here at uh, Texas A&M. And it's one of the founding members of the Beef Reproduction Task Force and has been with the group for a long time. And we really appreciate all the work you have done over the years, George. And I do not wanna to get too long. So George, thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Vitor. So uh, as Vitor mentioned, Sarah Murray and myself were going to give this presentation. She emailed me on Sunday that she had come down with COVID and would it be here? And so the first set of slides, give me some leeway as I go through her slides, but we're going to talk about management decisions on the cow herd. So why is management so important? As we're talking about the cow herd and we're talking about things we do, I like to put up this slide. And these are traits and a pet peeve of mine is that reproduction is a little heritable. And everybody says you can't inherit fertility. But when we actually look at the traits, we can see their antral follicle count. Whoops, going too far. Uh, See antral follicle count, age at puberty, track scores, horn diameter, age at first calving, heifer pregnancy rates, follicle diameter, stability, pregnancy rates. What goes from left to right here? Why does heritability increase? What is the main factor involved with all of that decreases heritability? I like things interactive, so y'all can speak up, ask questions, all of that. That's a table of students. Biggest half of them are mine. What is the issue going from left to right? Y'all heard this. <laughs> time, but what, so as time gets involved, what do we do? We have management. What can management do? We can screw up the genetics. And so that's why it's important, the previous session of management on heifer development, but then also management of how we get the cows from calving to rebreeding. And so if you look at the economic data, the economic data would tell you that it takes about six calves for this cow to pay for herself. And so we need to be able to keep her in the herd long enough to recuperate the cost that we need for her to be in the herd. And so when you look at net present value, the longer a cow is in a herd, the more valuable she is. Why? She's recouped that cost. She's paying her annual cost. We're actually able to make a profit off of her. Where we lose the most money is these animals that leave the herd after one or two calves. Because we haven't recouped what we had to put into them. We're losing our genetic gains. And so that's the reason this management of the cow herd after they calve to get them rebred becomes very important. And so this is the production cycle. We have conception, gestation, parturition, calving, weaning, puberty, and then they join back in. And so as we're thinking about this, there's all of these management decisions that come into play and anything that negatively impacts anything in here drives our cost up. And when we look around this area this year, especially the drought situation, the feed cost, what hay is costing to get forage into animals. We're on very narrow profit margins. And so we need to be able to maximize what we can. And so the area we really wanna focus on here is this period from calving to rebreeding and how we can get that as efficiently as possible. 
And so Sarah and I were going to split this into two parts. I'm going to cover the first part of her slides and then move on. The first thing to look at this as we're looking at implementing any reproductive technology, we're looking at the cow herd. Some questions to start asking yourself. What has been my pregnancy rate in cows and calves and heifers first 60 to 70 days of the breeding season? Now we heard a little bit this morning, we need to define some of these things. So when I pregnancy rate, are we all thinking the same thing? Pregnancy rate is the total number of cows pregnant divided by the number of cows exposed during that time period. So every cow out there counts. If you're looking at breeding season pregnancy rates and we want to start implementing any technology or we want to take a herd to the next level, we really want to be greater than 85%. As we take a next step, what proportion of your herd is calved in each one of the 21 day cycles? You heard Vitor, uh, Dr. Cushman's uh, study this morning where we looked at longevity, took heifers as calving in the first 21 days, second 21 days or later, and longevity in the herd. And so if we're looking at that, what should our benchmark be? What are the goals when we're looking at each one of those time points? So if we're thinking about breaking it into those 21 day estrus intervals, we should really be shooting for almost two thirds of our animals to calve in the first 21 days. Why is this important? We just wrapped up a study in South Dakota that we had started a few years ago. We took producers that had never done anything before. All they had done is turn the bull out. And we stepped them through year by year. The first year we synchronized with natural service. Then we synchronized an AI. Some of them went all the way to synchronized an AI with sex semen. Why did we step producers through instead of saying, Hey, let's just go synchronize and AI your cows. Because when you look at the calving distribution, and actually Lacey, when she was an undergrad, did it with one of our research farms. If you look at the calving distribution, when you first turn out just a bull, how many of those operations are getting two thirds of their cows to calve in the first 21 days? And so as we do this, you'll see there's a slide in here talking about the snowball effect. How do you implement these things to then continuously improve them? What does the calving pattern of your young cows look like? This is what's moving into your herd. And so why in that study that Bob put out, did we start looking at heifers and not just worry about the cow herd. Every year, those heifers going into your cow herd become the future of your cow herd. So if your heifers are calving late, what does that do to the postpartum interval? What does that do to the ability of your cow herd to actually respond and move into a successful breeding season? And so if your calving distribution looks like this, where you have some of them calving early, but the most of them are middle to late, that's not gonna make for a successful time looking at your cow herd. And so when we look at the overall effects, what impacts pregnancy rates? I'll get the right button here before this is over. Estrus detection rate, conception rates and pregnancy rates. So I said a while ago, pregnancy rates were the number pregnant out of the total exposed. If we look at estrus detection rates, Kai and Mario did a good job talking about synchronization. Estrus detection rates are those animals detected in estrus. If we're doing a fixed time AI protocol, what percentage of cows do we consider our estrus detection rate? Do you do estrus detection on them? Depends. 
conception rates, what's the difference between a conception rate and a pregnancy rate? A conception rate is the percentage of animals that conceive that semen was put in. So if I never detect that cow in estrus, I never put semen in her, she doesn't count in a conception rate. She does count in the pregnancy rate. So that's why you see estrus detection rate times conception rate gives you pregnancy rates. So if we do a good job detecting estrus, we get pretty good conception rates. We see on any single insemination, 67%, conceiving. Now in a fixed time AI, these two numbers will be the same because we breed everybody. What if we don't do a good job of detecting estrus or the bull doesn't do a good job? What happens? We see our pregnancy rates go down. Same thing if we have fertility issues. On the male or the female side, if we have fertility issues, we actually see our conception rates drop. We drop our pregnancy rates. Well, what happens if it's both? And we can see how quickly we can drop from good to bad in our pregnancy rates. And it really comes down because when we think about reproduction, and we just had this discussion among some of us last night, what is the most critical point? What is the most critical point of reproduction? It's whatever you do the worst. We can sit here and debate whether it's herd health, whether it's nutrition, whatever it is, but with reproduction, you will never do better than your worst event. And what I used to teach students in AI school in that is we can teach everything perfect. You can put semen in the correct spot, that cow can be an estrus, you can ovulate, but if I put dead semen in there, guess what conception rates are going to be? Or, hey, I can put the best semen there is, but instead of heat detecting, I'm just going to go breed them every day. If she's not in estrus and not ovulated, what are our conception rates going to be? We'll never do better than what our poorest link is. And so that for every individual operation, and so anybody, any of you who know me well know I don't believe in anything that's cookie cutter. Everything is unique to that operation. When we talk about synchronization protocols or that, I want to sit down with somebody and say, what is your operation like? What are your goals? And so as we're going through this, think about your operation. Think about what impacts your herd and what you can do. And it's the little details that really drive those conception rates. So what are the primary reasons that a cow fails to become pregnant? Really the first one, she doesn't show estrus during the breeding season. That's estrus detection rate. We also have that she fails to conceive following estrus. So let's start with the first one. The biggest impact for a reason for an animal not showing estrus is the anestrus period. Now I wanna see, get some involvement here. How many of you actually know what the anestrus period is? I see some hands, I see some heads. Okay, some of you are still awake. I thought the ice cream, a little chill would keep people more awake, but. So that's the period, and it doesn't matter if it's a cow that's calved or if it's a heifer before she's reached puberty, that's that period where she cannot get bred. She's not cycling, she's not, showing estrus, she's not ovulating. In this talk, we're gonna focus on the postpartum period. And we always talk a lot about how poor fertility was in dairy cattle. But do you realize in dairy cattle, they actually will start estrus cycles faster than most beef cows do. And if you look at this, this bottom down here, Dr. Short published several years ago on factors that impact the postpartum period. And it kind of shows the days, uterine involution, short estrus cycles, and then the anestrus period. This up here shows when follicular growth occurs. 
that first follicular wave usually starts within about 10 days after parturition. And so we get follicular growth. And so the ovary starts responding, starts having good growth, but it's not until they ovulate do we get over the postpartum anestrous period. The first thing that occurs, uterine involution, so we can actually breed an animal days after she calves. But with uterine involution, we don't get sperm transport to the site of fertilization. And so that's a physical barrier to the fertility. But the good thing is most cows get over that in two or three weeks. Short estrus cycles are really this little peak that occurs. And it occurs the first time an animal ovulates after puberty. It occurs the first time they ovulate after parturition. About 80% of animals have that short estrus cycle. And it really comes into play when we start talking about synchronization too. What does that short estrus cycle do? It really sets the uterus up. It sets the uterus up with the timing because you have to think about when that cow shows estrus, the body starts a clock. That clock goes time point to ovulation, a time point for maternal recognition of pregnancy, and it changes the uterus for what needs to be secreted. Because one of the things that's really unique about ruminants and about cattle especially, is for almost that first month, they totally live off of the secretions into the uterus. And so if the uterus and the embryo aren't in correct timing, we're not gonna have good fertility. And so this impacts whether we're AIing or embryo transfer, to make sure that uterus is in the correct timing to the embryo that's in there. The next one to get over those short cycles and to get to cyclicity, if we want a yearly calving interval, what do we have? We've got about 80 days. Depending on the situation, it's common for beef cows to run 80 days in an anestrous period. So what really drives some of those factors? Can we get better pregnancy rates just by extending the breeding season? Comments have been made on why can just leave the bull out year around. Well, if you look here, this was actually a study done in Missouri several years ago. If they increase the length of the breeding season from 70 to 150 days, Look at what happened to herd pregnancy rates. Really doesn't change. There's always going to be some level of infertility. There's always going to be some cows that fall out each year. And just giving them longer is never going to overcome that. But what does giving them longer do? If we look, this graph on the left shows days of the calving season and the percent of cows failing to calve the next year. So if they calved in the first 20 days of the calving season, the percent failed to calve the next year. Where if they didn't calve until day 120 or a laughter, 37% did it calve the next year. So we can see where the comment put earlier, where are your young cows calving? We want them in the cow herd early. We want to put the selection pressure for good fertility to get them in early to carry that all the way through the breeding season. And we can see here, lifetime averages for weaning weight, those that calved early, weaned heavier calves, those that calved late, less. The slide that Vitor put up this morning showed over those first five calves, heavier weaning weights in heifers that calved in the first 21 days as they went on through being cows. And so we really do see this snowball effect with fertility. So when we think about our cow herd, we need to think about what we implement this year, how it's not only going to affect this breeding season, but two or three down the road. 
And I'll never forget when I was in graduate school, I went to a seminar. They actually were talking more about business decisions. And the big thing that I took from it was the slide that was put up and they were discussing when is a management change made? When do you realize those benefits? And this goes with any business, but in reality, if you make a management decision, what happens the first year after you make that management decision? Usually things go down. Usually the second year you'll be back to where you started and then the third year you'll start to see the benefits. And so we've got to see this snowball effect where we implement things, we go through that little downtime and then see how they continue to build. And so when we're looking at that, the more cows that have longer intervals, the more successful we'll be because we have more of them to get over that anesthesia period. We have more of them that will respond. And so you see how it builds from year to year. And so what are the big factors that influence that anesthesia period? Suckling status, nutrition, dystocia, bull stimulus, synchronization, they all play a role. And so when we think about things, and I was talking about dairy cows, suckling becomes a big thing. The body decides to use nutrients based upon what its requirements are. And if a calf is at that cow side, where does she feel her requirements need to be? After herself, she's going to feed that calf. And so you can come in and you can limit cycling or suckling. You see if they're suckled freely, took longer days to the first ovulation, days to first estrus, versus if they're restricted, they suckle twice a day, they cycle back quicker. But it's not just suckling. So work that was done, you come in and you mastectomize the cows. And you can see if you mastectomize one and remove the calf, they'll actually start cycling in about two weeks. But what happens even when you mastectomize them, but that calf is still present? There's no different than when their udder is intact and that calf is present. That calf being at that side, they know they have the requirements. They put the energy and effort into producing that calf. Their goal is to keep it alive. And so what do we do in drought years like this? Are there management decisions we can come in with? Or do we suffer through it and deal with things for the next several years? Well, there's several things that can be done. One of them is managing that suckling. Kind of in an extreme event, the early weaning. And the reason I say it's an extreme event is because if you do early wean, you have to make sure you can manage those calves. But are there benefits to it in a drought situation? Yes. You can see two-year-olds, three-year-olds, and four-year-olds, the percent increase by early weaning calves why does it have a bigger impact on two-year-olds than a four-year-old? That two-year-old is still growing. It still has the nutrient requirements for its body. And so that's where you're going to see the biggest impact on it. But like I said, you've got to make sure you manage the calves correctly or you're going to have a bigger problem with them. The other things that come in is we can temporarily remove the calf or limit suckling to try to remove some of that pressure from the cow to help her get cycling back sooner. Same thing, we need to make sure we manage those calves correctly. But that's probably one of the biggest impacts on the anesthesia period is that calf at her side. So I was just talking about, I'm sure all of you have seen the barrel for nutrients, we start off with maintenance. That cow's gonna keep herself alive, her skeletal maintenance, growth, so young cows, lactation, then reproduction. 
And so for her to start cycling back, we have to get enough nutrients in her for her to think she's able to produce another calf. And so it really comes down to what's more important here, pre-calving or post-calving nutrients for reproduction. And there's been lots of studies done. This is one example. If we have high nutrients, high energy pre-calving or high energy post-calving versus low, if you look at interval to estrus, high pre-calving, they all start interval to estrus earlier than if they're low. So pre-calving energy, we know going into the calving season what to prepare for for the following breeding season. And we can see that because if they have enough body reserves, they're gonna get over that negative energy quicker. But what about conception rates? High high, of course, has the best, but look, if she was low before and high, her conception rates were just as good when she did start cycling. <clears throat> and so we can see post-calving nutrition impacts conception rates, but pre-calving nutrition allows them to start cycling sooner. The other thing to throw out here as we're thinking about it is follicular growth. As we're thinking about follicular growth, that follicle we're trying to breed, that oocyte, the egg in that follicle, when did it start growing for the breeding season? The interval from follicular growth until ovulation is about 90 days. What I say from calving to rebreeding, if we're going to calve on a yearly interval is about 80 days. And so how many of you think about the nutrition and how you're managing your cow at calving to impact your breeding season? But really that's where the follicle that we're going to breed off of starts. And so you can see that this was a large study. They looked at body condition scores and calving intervals. And you can see here, we want cows to be basically a five or greater to maintain a yearly calving interval. And I'm sure most of you have seen what body conditions are, fives and six, nice appearance, have some flat cover, versus the other one side out of that, a body condition score, you start to see ribs, versus an eight where you start to see fat. What is the problem with getting to either side of those? As we get down to a body condition score four, we're not having the nutrition in them for them to start cycling at a good time. What happens here? Do you realize that steroids are hydrophobic? What does that mean? Steroids prefer fat over water. And so when we get an animal fat, what happens? They don't actually see the steroids in their body that drive the ester cycle the same way. And so there's actually several studies out that show as you start getting cows up to a body condition score seven and a half, eight, you actually see fertility go down. And so there really is an ideal spot in there for maintaining body condition. And so this is looking at the requirements. When are the requirements the highest for those cows? We look right after lactation or right after the start of calving. We see here, that's when energy is the highest, protein's the highest, dry matter intake stays about the same. When is its lowest? Right after weaning, because she no longer has to lactate. So what are other factors that come in for postpartum interval? Age, the older a cow gets, the sooner she's going to reinitiate estrous cycles. And also dystocia. A cow that has calving problems is going to take longer to initiate cycles than one that isn't. 
This shows overall detection in asterisk AI conception rate, total conception rates. There's actually a study out of Mile City where they went in and helped cows as soon as they started calving. And what was the biggest conclusion there? For every 30 minutes after the start of stage two labor that an animal has not calved, you get about a six day delay in the initiation of estrous cycles. What about synchronizing? Progestins do a tremendous job initiating estrous cycles. And so here's uh, four studies that were done in Missouri looking at anestrus and cycling cows. Look at their estrus response. What does a cedar do in an anestrus animal? It mimics that short cycle. It allows her to get over that quicker and get into normal estrus cycles. That normal, that normal short cycle that occurs from ovulation to the next is about 10 days. So what is the rise in progesterone? About six to seven. We see the same thing occur with our synchronization protocol. And then the other one that's in here is biostimulation. How many of you that just turn out bulls see a peak, see a lot more cows coming into estrus about two weeks after you turn the bulls out. The pheromones that those bulls produce actually stimulate cows to start cycling. But what's interesting about that, it has to be a novel exposure. So if your calving season, if your breeding season is 365 days, there is no novel exposure. So it's that introduction of the bull that helps trigger that. And so it really allows those animals and working in South Dakota, there was a lot of producers that just turned out bulls for a very short breeding season because you can't year around up there. That would always come back and say, you know, but about three weeks after I turned out the bull is when my peak calving, not right when I turned him out. Well, yeah, because you're getting this biostimulation to get more animals cycling. And so once we get those animals over this anestrus period and we get them into having normal estrus cycles, now we can come into the other management decisions that are going to impact her fertility. And so this is where Sarah and I were going to switch. Estrus detection. Estrus detection is critical if we want a cow to get pregnant. Without it, it doesn't matter if it's us or the bull, fertility is low. Mario actually on Boss Indicus cattle had the numbers up here. On a single service AI, cows that showed estrus, he said 65% fertility. Those that didn't show estrus, 25%. So do we have drugs that can induce ovulation? Sure, that's what GNRH will do. But look at the difference in fertility. And we've published several papers looking at gene expression in the uterus and everything else. That estrus, that onset of estrus starts that clock. That clock that sets up whether that embryo is going to survive or not. Lots of estrus detection aids out there. But what are they? They are AIDS. They tell you if a cow has shown estrus, but not when. Unless it's the computerized ones, they don't really tell you when they show estrus. And so we still have to put time into it. And so estrus detection becomes the most labor intensive part of getting cows rebred. But how important is it? So this was a study done at Colorado State. Intensive at that time was the heat watch system. Casual was 30 minutes morning and evening. So herd was split in half. 
synchronize the same way. And look, there's a 30% difference in what was detected in estrus based upon the effort put into it. Conception rates. So I said a while ago, conception rates are the percent pregnant out of those that semen was put into. There's a 20% difference in conception rates here. They were all detected in estrus. Why do you get a 20% difference in conception rates? timing of when things are occurring. Synchronization rate times conception rate gives you pregnancy rate. 71% pregnancy rate to 35. Everybody's thrilled with a 71%. And looking around the crowd, let's see, it could either be the semen companies, the nutrition, the minerals. Who gets blamed for the 35? And it's really, in this study, was the effort put into estrus detection. And so we see how critical it can be. And when I talked about the timing, this was from Dr. Saki's lab, where they inseminated early and late. We did a similar project, not to this in depth, but if you look, AI is a compromise. Kai talked about it earlier on, we want biggest overlap of viable semen to when the egg is also viable. And so when we look at it that way, if we inseminate too early, what happens? We have really good embryo quality, but low fertilization rate because the sperm doesn't live long enough. If we inseminate too late, we have the opposite. We have low embryo quality, but high fertilization rate. Why? There's lots of good sperm there, but the egg's old. And so we make this compromise. We actually did a study that we purposely bred 30 hours before the onset of estrus to 30 hours after. And what was the biggest thing we saw? There was one bull. It didn't matter. He had 60 plus percent conception rates the entire time. What about the other bull that was in the study? He ran 20 to 30 percent conception rates until 18 hours after the onset of estrus. He jumped up to 60 percent and looked great afterwards. So what does that tell us? There's definitely bull differences in longevity. The discussion's been made about sex semen and breeding later. Because of the lifespan of the semen. If we look, when do cows show estrus? There's over 500 head in here of continuous observations. And you can see majority of these animals early in the morning or late in the evening. When it's coolest, when they can be out and around. This was done in Boss Taurus cattle, but we can see over 56% at night. This is where aids help you because they tell you something's showing heat when you can't be out watching. Believe me, I've tried. I've tried to heat detect black cows in the dark by flashlight. It's an interesting activity. With fixed time AI, is estrus important? We talk about fixed time AI protocols. They work very well. Do I need to worry about estrus expression? So Brittany, one of my students a few years ago, we did a meta-analysis. There's 26 different studies in here. Overall, there's about a 27% improvement in fertility if that animal showed estrus prior to fixed time AI compared to if she did it. So what does that tell you? If you go out to do a fixed time AI and you're not seeing a lot of estrus activity, should you be concerned? Yeah. Prime example of that, I had a producer call me one day. It was early one morning. He was there, I'm supposed to be uh, breeding my cows this morning. I've got 300 cows and right now there's three of them with activated patches. I said, okay, first thing, stop. 
don't go breed them. So we started talking through everything and somewhere his timing got off by 12 hours. Instead of breeding that morning, he was supposed to breed that evening, but on his calendar, he had to go breed them this morning. The next morning he called me and said, you know, by that night when we bred, he was pushing like 70%. What would have happened if he would have just gone out and bred everything that morning? I mean, some of them would have gotten pregnant, but we've looked at that. If you induce that ovulation before that rise in estradiol, fertility is lower. And it was totally due to, I'm sure they were handwritten, but a typo of 12 hours thinking he should breed in the morning and in the evening. So knowing those little details of, hey, I'm supposed to go breed now and nobody's showing heat becomes critical for maximizing that fertility. The other graph in here is actually a group of dairy cows in Europe that is selected for high and low fertility. And what's interesting is this herd has been selected for years for fertility and they have higher estrus activity. And so you can see the correlations with the behavioral estrus all the changes that go on in the body. I don't have time to go into everything, but we've shown changes in uterine pH. Why is uterine pH important? pH actually affects sperm motility. What we hypothesize is that drop in uterine pH at the onset of estrus likely helps sperm live longer. We've shown changes in gene expression because we need to set that uterus up to be receptive for that embryo to implant. And so if we don't get those changes, the starting of that clock, we don't get the good level of fertility. Study we published a few years ago, this was using sex semen. We can see animals that showed estrus, 89% of control. So there's the gender sorted, conventional. We're giving up 11% fertility through sexing. Everybody's heard this comments of 20, 25%, whatever between sexed and conventional semen. Well, what happens if patches were just partially activated? So they were just starting to come into heat. We're asking that semen to live longer. 82% of control. What happened in those cows that had no activity at all? So they were given a shot of GnRH. What does a shot of GnRH do? Shot of GnRH causes an LH surge to then cause ovulation. What's the interval from GnRH to ovulation? About 30 to 34 hours. I don't know if any of you noticed, what was the time intervals Kai had up earlier for lifespan of sperm? About 24 hours. I'm not a math major, but 24 is less than 32. We're asking that sperm to live longer than the time of ovulation. Sometimes it does it well, but what happens? No activity at all. 59% of control. You can see both of these are poor, but that's where the big hit is. When we try to take sex semen and make it live longer. But a question I get asked frequently, natural service versus AI. So the male effects of things. This was a large study done out of Australia. No difference detected in pregnancy rates. Almost 14,000 first service AIs or 6,000 first service natural services. Good fertile bull, pass a breeding soundness exam. Good libido, mature bull. 
Why does this say first service? There's no cherry picking, they're all first services versus a good AI technician with good semen and cows that show heat, there's not going to be a difference. Now think of all those caveats I threw in there. A good bull, a good fertile bull with good libido. Okay, he's gonna go detect estrus. A good technician with good semen that saw the cows in heat. Any one of those things and we can see changes in these. And so it's all these little details that impact fertility. So thinking about that inseminator efficiency, how many of you think about, I know Kai talked about it earlier, we put in semen into a cow that showed estrus at the correct time, we get fertilization about 95% of the time. So it's really, our management that impacts that embryonic loss. The cow and the bull are doing what they're supposed to. It's the stuff we do that then can impact things. And so here's just showing inseminating at the correct location, right into the uterine body. Why do we not want to go past that? Are there negative effects if I inseminate down here? Not if done correctly. But if we get blood in the uterus, conception rates really go down. What happens the other way? Well, there's data out there that if we end up in the cervix, there's at least a 10% drop in conception rates. Does this happen? You know, one study that looked at it showed about 20% of the time. So we see these variations that can occur. Another thing that goes on pre-breeding that I wanted to touch on was some work we've done for several years now is looking at when should we vaccinate animals? We put a demand on the body when everything we do to them and everything with reproduction is give and take And if you were in the herd health one earlier, we were talking about setting cows up early in life to be successful. That anytime you vaccinate, there's some animals that don't respond. And so we get multiple injections into them. We get multiple doses. But each one of those doses takes a demand on the body. And so we wanna get heifers vaccinated before or around the time of weaning to get them started early in life. And with the data we've done, and I don't have time to go through all of it, I tell people at least 45 days. There's data that we're looking at. Uh, Caitlin has some stuff over there looking at the CLs, which I'm not gonna go into her stuff for time. We're seeing effects that last for about two estrous cycles. And so we wanna make sure to give the body time to recover. And if they haven't previously been vaccinated, we wanna be careful with what we do. And the reason I put this up here is if you didn't give them the vaccine or weren't standing there and saw the bottle, it didn't happen. Because I can tell you horror stories I've been called in on, large groups of animals bought, were told, oh, they were vaccinated with this product prior to breeding, truck them someplace, person that bought them, Craig checked them, gave them the exact same vaccine, which according to label, if it had been given pre-breeding was fine and they aborted 100 to 300 cows. Turned out to be a very bad day. And then when they looked into it and they started asking questions, oh no, we didn't use that product this year. We used a different one. And so if it's not you, how confident can you be what was given and when? We did a study going on several years ago now 
looking at naive heifers because I started getting asked all the time, can I vaccinate at the start of the breeding season? The dogma that has always been out there is IBR and BVD viruses like the dominant follicle, they'll impact the dominant follicle, they'll decrease luteal function and decrease fertility. We get over it, no problem. That's the reason the labels read approximately 28 or 30 days pre-breeding. What do we do with most synchronization protocols right now? We go to synchronize an animal, we give them GnRH. We get rid of that dominant follicle. So if that's the only thing impacted, we shouldn't have to worry about it. But what we did in this study is we took truly naive animals. These were all seronegative animals. They had two doses of a killed vaccine, one dose of a modified live or control that got saline. And if we look at pregnancy rates, there's no difference between these. These are really low. You might look at these pregnancy rates and say, oh, well, it's really high. These animals, if there was a chance for them to conceive, there was, there was enough semen put in them. They were AI'd two different times at intervals, plus a bull turned in with them. So there was not a lack of semen being present for them to get pregnant. Why was that one group so low? Almost 40% of them had an abnormal cycle. This is the abnormal cycles. This is normal. Progesterone should come up and stay up. All of these, we talked about short cycles earlier. They had short cycles. And so that vaccinating, and there were some in all of the groups, has a demand on the body. Second service conception rates. So with all of that daily blood sampling and everything else, we knew when the CL regressed, we knew when they came back into heat, bulls were out with them. The modified live still was below 40% conception rates. And so what does it do? It really kind of changed the dogma some on not only are we impacting the dominant follicle, we get rid of it with GnRH, it impacted the follicle that was growing during the synchronization process, and it even impacted the next cycle. And if you go back to about the mid-70s, there is a study published in Naive Animals that showed it took two cycles for animals to recover from being vaccinated. So it really wasn't that new, something we really hadn't looked into or thought about that much. What do the viruses do? Here's a normal corpus luteum. Those that were actually given IBR, you can see necrotic tissue, you can see uh, monocytes coming in. So it really affects luteal function. You see the same thing when they're vaccinated. You can see all the lymphocytes, you can see necrotic tissue. And so when we look at these things and we look at the impact, if a heifer is naive, we need to stay away from modified lives at that time, because it is going to impact things for at least two estrous cycles. What about well-vaccinated animals? When I was a grad student, there's two papers a lot of us reference. This one, about 800 animals, three different vaccination times, the second one, 90 days pre-breeding. The third one, either 40 or three days pre-breeding. If you look, no difference in conception rates, no difference in days to conception. Between 40 and three days, 
Here's heifers. Dr. Stormshack did this one. No difference in estrus expression, no difference in AI, no difference in breeding season pregnancy rates. This was 30 or nine days. And so what was the conclusion drawn from these for many years? Nine days or 30 days, which is label, there's not a difference. But what's the difference in these? They're comparing the timing, not different treatments. So when we were looking through the literature, there actually are some papers that come through and show, here's 40 and 10 days, here's 61 and 31 days, modified live versus a killed vaccine. There's a 20 and a 15% difference, but if you read the paper, it says it's not statistically different. Well, why is that? Because that's not what the study was designed to test. There were 10 or 20 animals per treatment. With reproductive questions, where you have a yes, no answer, it takes large numbers of animals to answer a question. Here's another one, modified live versus saline. 20% difference. So we did a large field study. This was done over two years. There's just shy of 1,500 head. Our goal was to design a study that would statistically pick up between a five and 10% difference. And if you look, modified live, saline and control, there's about a five to 8% difference between the modified live and the killed vaccine for AI pregnancy rates when it was given 30 days pre-breeding. So exactly by label. The killed got two doses, the saline got given saline twice. And if you look, it carried it all the way out through the breeding season. So then the question always is what gives better protection? Modified live or killed? And we could probably have that debate in here the rest of the day. But this was a study that was done uh, in Walsh's lab. And this really talks more to me, more about getting animals set up correctly. Because if you look, they had a group of animals at weaning. They either got a modified live or saline. They were vaccinated again before the first breeding season. They went through the next year at their annual booster, they got a modified live. This is a killed vaccine. This is the chemically altered one or saline. They calved, they bred them again. So they were on yearly vaccinations. But out here, they challenged them with a BVDPI animal or here's IVR, bovine herpes virus. And what happened? If we look at preventing abortions, we can see both of the treatments, the modified live and the killed. And so the discussion in the uh, herd health one earlier was talking about the hormonal or the humoral and the cellular responses. By getting the animals both, you set up both sides of the immune system. And getting a modified live into them early in life gets that immune system set up. And then there's data out there from Auburn that actually shows when you then switch to a killed, you actually get very good antibody responses because you give a big slug of virus or of vaccine and it actually has a very good response. But we have to make sure animals are set up correctly to have protection, because there's studies that if they're not set up correctly, we don't have good protection. We did a second field trial because there was lots of questions about that one. And so this second one, we just compared modified live versus killed. There's over 1,500 head. There's nine different herds in here. And look, we had about the same, the 5 to 8% difference in our AI pregnancy rates. 
So what I told people when we finished these studies at that time, can I tell you the mechanism? No, but we had over 3,000 head, over 18 different herds that we saw a five to 8% difference. If you wanna start talking about the mechanisms, Caitlin's poster over here has some of the details we're looking into. It really does seem to affect luteal function and having an impact on the corpus luteum can impact fertility because we're seeing even well-vaccinated animals have an abnormal ester cycle. So when we get down to that timing, I mentioned this earlier, from preantral growth to ovulation, so the size here to here takes about 42 days from primordial follicles to go through all the preantral growth all the way to ovulation takes about 90 days. And so giving the ovary time to cover allows us to get over some of these impacts and allows those animals to move on because you vaccinate an animal, you're pulling things from other areas. So what other important considerations are there at synchronization to impact fertility? I've actually gotten called on this one several times this year with the drought is shipping stress. And it actually goes further than that. It's more of a handling stress. But how does stress impact fertility? If you look, these studies were done up at Mile City, Montana. Animals were synchronized bred, put on a truck, driven an hour down the interstate, turned around, drove back, put back in the same pen. No change in environment, no change in nutrition, just that handling stress. And if you look, synchronized conception rates, if they were trucked day one to four, Pregnancy rates were 74%, breeding season pregnancy rates 95. If they were truck days eight to 12, 62%. That's a 12% loss in AI pregnancies, but no difference in the breeding season. Day 29 to 33, 65%, so there's a 5% loss. No difference in breeding season. What's going on? We're getting a pregnancy more established, but what's more critical about these time points? Days eight to 12 is right before maternal recognition of pregnancy. At day eight to 12, she doesn't even know she's pregnant. Day 29 to 33, that embryo is getting attached. And then we're disrupting things that way. The last one out there, 45 to 60, these animals were actually preg checked before they got on a truck. Then the same way, truck two hours, back in the same pens, there's a 6% loss. And so what do you see? The further in pregnancy they are, the less you lose. Tom did some studies following that up, looking at it. For some situations, even going through the shoot was enough to cause abortions. And so it really comes down to the animals. Heifers seem much more susceptible than cows because they haven't experienced life as much. So when we think about that time course and we think about what's critical for embryos, Day zero is estrus, they ovulate the next day. We start going through these cellular divisions. So we see down here blastocyst formation, day seven to eight. This would be the time of embryo transfer. That embryo hatches a few days later. Day 15 to 17 is maternal recognition of pregnancy. So I point out to people, what's the easiest thing to lose? Something you don't know you have. So those first two weeks after she was bred, she doesn't know if she's pregnant or not. 
So guess what? Anything we do to stress her to change anything, if she changes her body, if she changes her function, she's going to lose that embryo because she never even knew it was there. If it's after maternal recognition of pregnancy, the body's going to say, hey, I've already put effort into this. I'm going to try to maintain it. And so we see that in that chipping stress, where after we get past maternal recognition of pregnancy, things go down. And as you get further out, you see placent early attachment, placentation, definitive attachment to the uterus. As you get further out, it's going to be easier to maintain that pregnancy. And actually, even as Kai showed from 40 something days through parturition, excuse me, there's going to be less than 5% loss in most situations. So I mentioned earlier what's unique is from ovulation to the site of fertilization through early embryo development. That embryo is totally dependent upon the secretions into the uterus. And so with that, anything we do to impact those secretions are going to impact that embryo survival. Thank you, Sandy. And so up until that embryo is definitively attached to the uterus, we're going to have negative consequences with things we do. And so another area we've worked a lot on is how does nutrition impact things? This was a study we looked at just to see what nutrition right after AI would impact embryo quality and how much of a change is needed. And so this was a group of heifers. They were all on a positive plane of nutrition. They were all synchronized AI the same way. There's eight different replicates in here. At AI, they either stayed on a positive plane of nutrition, 100% or 120% of energy requirements, or they were restricted to 80% or less of requirements. And the reason it's listed as less is because we restricted two different ways, because we wanted to see what the impact was. One way is they were fed less of the feed they were getting. So what does that do? They're getting 80% of their requirements, but in a small amount. So what does that make them? That makes them feel hungry. The other way they were restricted was they were fed all of the oat straw they could eat. And it was piled into bonds. I mean, they were standing there eating and that, but they physically could not eat enough to get 100% of their energy requirements. Then on day six, we flushed embryos and evaluated them. So these are all fungal ovulation flushes. What did we see? There was no difference in the two methods of restricting. So feeling hungry or just not having enough energy did not change the results. So they're listed here as gain and loss. You can see embryo recovery rate was about 70%, so actually pretty good. Embryo stage, 4.6 versus 3.8. Now these are day six embryos. So this is just before blastocyst. You're almost a day younger when they were synchronized and AI'd the same way, all flushed on day six. If you took that embryo and evaluated it, you would have thought it was a day younger. Embryo quality, two versus 2.8. Remember embryo quality one is the best grade. We're almost a grade lower in embryo quality in those that were restricted. Accessory sperm numbers, no different. So we did an impact sperm transport. Didn't impact the number of dead cells, 
total cells were impacted. So that makes sense. These were further developed. They had more cells. But what's interesting, they also had a higher percentage of alive cells. So this group down here, not only was the embryo less developed, it had fewer cells and more cells that were dead. And that's only six days of nutrient restriction. And that's restricting at 80% of what the NRC says they need. So when we think about embryo survival and we think about maintaining that pregnancy, we know 95% get fertilized. Now we're talking about embryo maintenance. All of these little management decisions really impact that embryo survival. So when we think about the breeding season, consistency becomes critical. We don't want to stress animals. We don't want to go through big nutrient changes. We want that body to be as consistent as it can, looking at uh, maintaining pregnancy. And so then the big question comes down to how do we know what went wrong? So this is the equation of reproduction. And as best as I can track it back, this goes back to Jim Wiltbanks years and years ago. And there was some other stuff put up from Dr. Wiltbanks earlier from the 1970s asking about how much things have changed. Well, when he proposed this, we can still diagnose a lot of our problems with four simple questions. Animals detected in estrus and inseminated. Inseminator efficiency, fertility level of the herd, fertility level of the semen. Those four simple things put as a percentage and multiplied together gives you single service conception rates. And if we think about every talk going on in this meeting, we're looking at one of these four characteristics. We've got two different sessions looking at male fertility. We're talking about herd fertility with herd health, with management. We're talking about animals detected in estrus and inseminated. And I talked some on inseminator efficiency. So every one of those becomes key. And any little change, we can see if we do 90, 95% in all but one area, we can drop down into 40% conception rates really easy. So what are primary problems? We started off talking about are our cows good candidates? Protocol compliance, whether that's synchronization, vaccination, any of the protocols sticking to what we're supposed to. Facilities, how much are we stressing animals? Nutrition, and then paying attention to details. But one of the things, usually, it is unlikely due to acti biological activity of a product or even the semen. And yes, I can say I have had a producer show up and knock on my office door holding their rep's semen tank saying, I've got too many cows coming back into estrus. Look at this semen. I did. It looked fine. Because if you know all the codes, I evaluated the semen, called the company, and said, hey, what did it look like when it left your facility? And so a lot of times it comes down to these management decisions. And it's really thinking about things beforehand. Preparation, attention to the details, and good management after. So with that, there's all kinds of people to thank all the grad students who, whoops, who actually do all the work we get to talk about. That's the reason these posters are so important, visit with all the grad students. 
and all the people who have funded all the research that we've gotten to talk about. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Yes. So you kind of talked about like transportation stress events and then nutritional stress events. In part of the U.S., a lot of, a lot of producers, you know, will, will develop their replacement heifers or so in a feedlot and then bring them and turn them out to pasture. How do you, how do you guys done any research on, on the conception rates affected by the stress of uh, both factors combined? Yeah, so I think Shelby talked a little bit about them last time. Uh, I was over in the bull side. Oh, repeat the question for the people online. Sorry. So for the people online, the question was, in the northern part of the country, a lot of heifers are developed in feedlots and then transported out after AI because it's key. it's easy, it's convenient. I mean, I spent 17 years in South Dakota. It's very handy to have cows or heifers in a feedlot, synchronize, breed them, and then haul them out. What if does that transportation and that nutritional change have going into pregnancy rates? So we looked several years at that. What we saw was up to about a 15% loss in AI pregnancy rates. By keeping them in a feedlot from weaning to breeding and then hauling them out to pasture. That varied a little bit based upon time of the year because if people who bred early, the grass was much better than people who bred in July. We did show that you can compensate for that by feeding the animals. Uh, we literally worked with a couple of different herds and we convinced them to take their heifers out to grass and split them in half and half of them got fed. And their comment was, these heifers are going out to belly deep grass. There's no way they'll come to a feed bunk. And the first day they drove out, every one of them was standing at the feed bunk. And when we think about behavior, that's what they were used to. From weaning, that's what they knew. Uh, we put pedometers on animals. And that's kind of a fun graph to show because those heifers that had pedometers, when you take a heifer from a feedlot out to pasture, that first day she walked about 16,000 steps, which I equate to, you know, you sit around on the couch for six months and then go run a marathon. And so we were seeing weight losses and everything else. We did show that you could overcome it by either feeding them and that could be fed different ways. There were producers we worked with that kept high quality hay and started feeding hay in the feedlot so they were used to eating it and then put that out in the pasture so they knew where they could get, you know, when I talk high quality, it was alfalfa, plenty of energy in it. So there were ways to overcome it. But yes, when you combine those two stresses, like I said, we were seeing up to about a 15% loss in AI conception rates. Okay. Yep. On that same question, a lot of times, say on a seven-day bears, it's convenient to leave them locked in the lot even though they've been on grass. What's your take on that? So we did look at that some too, if the animals, and we did it a lot with heifers because heifers had the most extreme stress. Uh, if cows spent the entire winter in a feedlot and then went out, we didn't see those losses because they were used to going out and grazing. So in that situation, we did it a few times. Where, like you said, it was easy to bring ant pears in, put cedars in them, leave them in the lot for seven days, went right back out as long as they were on a good diet when they were in the lot, we never saw any impact because they went from a diet where they were used to grazing. They just came in those seven days and they went back. We even tried it one time with heifers that had been out on forage, brought them into the lot. We saw no negative impact on reproduction because in that lot, if they were on a good diet, that was their choice to eat. So we, what we were really able to show is that when you take heifers and move them out to grass, it's a behavior effect. They just aren't eating enough. And that's where we were getting that negative energy intake. So, but no, leaving them in the lot for seven days. And I should preface that it's with, you know, I've seen cows brought into a lot in belly deep mud and things like when it's the right situations and you're not stressing them, so. Yes, sir. You showed that when semen is present when the tunnel ovulation 
we get a 95% fertilization rate. But we end up at a 60% maternal reproduction of pregnancy. Correct. A 35% drop. You explained that that was kind of fault. How would you fix that? <laughs> in a perfect world, labor is not an issue, time is not an issue, money is not an issue. How would you fix that? So the question is, when I talked about the data would say that 95% of the time fertilization occurs. And so when an animal's in estrus and good semen is there at time of fertilization, or in the egg is ovulated, we get fertilization 95% of the time. At whether it's maternal recognition of pregnancy or preg check, we lose somewhere 30 to 40%. And a lot of it is management. We get some other things in there too, so it's not all management, but how would I fix that? You know, looking at different operations, that's where the consistency comes into. How do we keep animals from not having stress? How do we make sure they stay on a positive plane of nutrition? How do we make sure? Those are all the little details. And so the consistency and the details, the herds we've worked with that I consistently see a 70 percent AI conception rate. So if I use that as the example out 30 to 45 days later, there's 20 percent in there I'm not sure we will ever fix, 20 to 30 percent. But there is some in there that those herds started prior to calving, and I used to get questions all the time in South Dakota, I'd start talking about breeding season in February before people started calving. And it's the same thing down here. It's just a different time of the year. And depending on when you're breeding, a lot of producers, we breed a lot in the fall. What is our worst time of the year for nutrition? It's probably in the summer, Depend, especially this year. So can we get those animals on a good plane of nutrition where that follicular growth, the development, everything is positive going into the breeding season and keep that consistent through the breeding season. We're not talking about uh, any of the fetal programming stuff, but we can see those effects carry all the way through to the next generation. And so to me, that's where the consistency and the details become so important, is if we go through any swings, we're going to impact things. Any stress, any handling, and it comes down to the animals. And so I don't have the silver bullet. I can't design the perfect one to say we're going to get 80% conception rates every time because Mother Nature throws in curveballs all the time. And so knowing those details but preparing early is really the herds that I see have the most consistent best conception rates because their cows don't go through those swings. You know, they're prepared okay, in drought situation, something comes in, I know my cows, I've got to get stuff. And that's the reason that heifer study that Vitor put up, I use it as an example a lot because that was at a USDA station. What happens at a USDA or at a research station when you start, run, when you get into a drought, you start feeding more because they're on research trials. You can't just sell the cows. And so, in the ideal situations, we still see those longevity issues. We still see those swings. But like I said, a lot of it, I think, is the management and the little details that we don't think about each year. Uh, the movement of animals, the diet changes, the, you know, I never once thought that turning a heifer out from a feedlot to grass until we started doing the study, because we had done the grass clippings. The forage was there. If they ate 2% of body weight, they should have been gaining a pound and a half a day. And we saw animals losing three pounds a day. And so those consistency and those details and really the record keeping. When I get called in and say, hey, what went wrong during the breeding season? When does that happen? It's usually five, six months after the breeding season. And so then everybody's trying to think about, well, what happened this year? What was different? And so the little notes and everything become important for troubleshooting and figuring out those year-to-year -year variations. So.
this to succumb. And I think a lot of times we think about we're doing research, we handle this cattle all the time, and we're collecting data sometimes weekly. And you back way out into some of these extensive operations, you got to think about it. They're going to go shoot for a shoot sometimes twice a year or three times a year. If you can recommend management decisions at preg test time in the fall, if we're using the Dakotas or Nebraska, <laughs> plan on trying to get that cow bred. This is most of the young cows. It can start right there rather than waiting till calving time. Or you can give the impact of nutrition and the long term success of that young cow at preg test time, for instance. So, yeah, the comment was made on research, and I'm going to paraphrase a little bit research herds where we're doing stuff all the time versus intensive and the handling and everything. And I used to talk about university herds, actually a lot of times have the best conception rates. And a lot of that is university herds, what are they used for? They're used for teaching. Those cows go through the chute constantly. Uh, we were doing a study, we were pulling DNA samples at the university herd in South Dakota one time, we filled up the tub full the alleyway full, pulled hair samples, and then would just open the head gate and let the whole alleyway out. Every one of the cows would walk in the chute and stop. You'd have to close it on them and open it up before they'd leave the chute. Believe it or not, we do have some Brahmin cows, even at Overton. Uh, some of them, though, you've got to really catch. But there's others that it's kind of, no, you're doing something to me. And so that whole not really temperament, but that whole disposition of the animal has a huge impact. Because yeah, a lot of the herds that are worked with, when do they get handled? They get handled to synchronize to AI, to preg check. And that's a lot for some of them. And so all of those handling are creating stresses to them. And so the more we do things, the more things are used to and that's, we see the biggest extreme in young cows because they're not used to it yet. It's a new event for them. And so, but yes, the handling, all of that, we don't understand stress. I mean, what's stress for you? What's stress for me? What's stress for, you know, the students? There's all different things based upon experiences and what we know and what we do. Those cows are the same way. A few years ago, we were teaching an AI school and it was kind of neat to see because we had a set of stanchions and the cow on this end, she was throwing a fit, she was standing up, nobody wanted to AI her. And everybody was talking about how stressed she was because she was trying everything she could to get out of those stanchions. The cow on the other end was literally standing there like a rock and just trembling. And it was there, which one's more stressed? Probably the one standing there because she's so stressed, she is literally locked up and she never moved the entire time until you opened the gate to let her out and she was gone. And so how we manage stress, how we understand stress, we talk about measuring cortisol, we talk about this. Cortisol is way down the pathway. So there, you can have stress before you measure differences in cortisol. And so... I think stress, whether it's nutritional, management, behavior, becomes critical to a lot of what we do. So, so yeah, those herds that never get handled. Yeah. AI perspective, you want to help somebody improve conception. Sometimes you have to back up the points when they do manage to make recommendations for six months down the road. And that's where facilities and everything else, because I've seen some facilities that not only stress the cows, but stress me being around them. So. Other questions? If not, thank y'all.